Thanks everyone for joining. We'll uh, wait for just a couple of minutes and seconds for some people still logging in right now as we open up the uh, webinar here today. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for our uh, new uh, edition of the Vet Chat series here at Grayson, uh, where we've uh, been chatting with researchers and veterinarians about different maladies and ailments uh, for horses. Uh, this uh, one we're very excited to bring you today. Uh, Dr. Ben Sykes, uh, Associate Professor in Equine Internal Medicine uh, from New South, is it Massey University now, Dr. Sykes? That's correct. Uh, is done research in this area before and actually is a uh, previous Grayson funded researcher uh, in this area with a team that did some work on omeprazole administration. Uh, this ailment uh, goes across all breeds of horses uh, in its equine gastric ulcer syndrome. And if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of the uh, Zoom software and uh, we'll uh, take those at the end of the session. Uh, but we just like to say, Dr. Sykes, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we know the time difference makes it difficult for us to do these kinds of things. So thank you so much. I'll turn my camera off now and uh, let you uh, proceed with the presentation. But again, thanks for your time and your work in this area. It's very important for all our horses. Thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, welcome to everyone and, th and thanks for coming along. So what I thought we'd talk about today is, you know, equine gastric ulcer syndrome, but really look at what we've learned in the past five years um, and, and bring some new elements in and maybe what we need to learn in the next five years and see if we can sort of cross that bridge between those two. So my affiliations, I work primarily, I'm an associate professor in equine internal medicine at Massey University in New Zealand. Um, and I have adjunct positions at the University of Queensland, the University of Liverpool. Uh, I've done a range of uh, paid consultancies and speaking engagements that I list there over the years. And um, as, as Jamie said, the Grace and Jockey Club Research Foundation were uh, a major sponsor of my PhD. And so some of the work I'm going to present today uh, directly relates to that, that support. So the first thing as we, you know, as we sort of start talking about equine gastric ulcer syndrome is to, to recognize that about five years ago, we had a very clear shift in the terminology that we use for the disease. And this is still filtering through somewhat. So I think it's worth reviewing. So the initial terminology equine gastric ulcer syndrome has been in use since 1999, um, when we first started talking about this as a disease syndrome in the horse in a meaningful way, at least, or in at least in a, in a, you know, a significant way. Um, and it's important to recognize that that syndrome comes from a time back in that, the late 90s, early 2000s, when the gastroscopes that we were using to look at horses' stomachs were relatively short. So we now would use a three to a three and a half meter gastroscope. Back in the day, the gastroscopes were two to two and a half meters long. And what that meant was when we went into the horse's stomach, this is pretty much what we could see. Um, and we could see really basically the squamous mucosa of the, of the horse's stomach with a little bit of glandular mucosa. But importantly, we couldn't see the very deep part of the horse's stomach, which is the pylorus or the pyloric antrum, where the stomach empties. And what that means is as we started getting bigger scopes and we started looking at the stomach more thoroughly, we recognized there's more to it than we originally thought. And so we started to see as we went down into the deeper part of the stomach, we started to see the pyloric antrum. And we started to see that we recognized lesions down there as well. And the important thing about that terminology is, is that as a diagnosis in an individual horse, there's really no such thing as gastric equine gastric ulcer syndrome. We sort of talk about it as this overarching term, but when we actually talk about the specific diagnosis in a specific course, then we're going to have something much more specific than that. So we have now what we call equine squamous gastric disease and equine glandular gastric disease. One of the challenges is, is that when you look at studies that predate the clarification of this terminology, so if we look at either uh, scientific literature or if we go to Google and we look at what we know and put get equine gastric ulcers into horses, pretty much everything we know relates to the squamous mucosa because that's what we were talking about at the time. It does make it hard sometimes as some of the early stuff did talk about glandular mucosa and then the terms become a little bit interchangeable. But what we've started to do in the last five years is really clearly define 
when we're talking about this disease in the scientific literature, and when we're talking about it in terms of an individual horse, or we're talking about it in terms of um, you know, prevention and treatment, these sorts of things, we start talking very specifically about the squamous mucosa and the glandular mucosa. I always assume if it's not stated in the literature or anywhere that we're talking about squamous, um, if it's, as I said, if it's something we look at with Google, it's nearly always about squamous. That's really important because when we talk about uh, prevention strategies and treatment, we have to recognize that that's very biased towards the squamous disease. So we've, fit, we've changed the terminology and what we've looked to say is that equine gastric ulcer syndrome is an umbrella term that encompasses a wide range of different things under that, particularly equine squamous gastric disease. And this is affecting the, the, the sort of half, top half of the stomach. Um, and this is very well understood and described. And then equine glandular gastric disease is something that we, we have a lower understanding of because it's something we've only been relatively recently looking at, but it affects the bottom half of the stomach and particularly the outflow of the stomach uh, into the pylorus, the pyloric, pyloric antrum and into the pylorus there. It's really important that we make this distinction because not only are they different in location, but the prevalences, the, the, the amount that we see it in any individual population varies and the affected populations we see varies greatly. So one group, you know, horses such as racehorses, we would traditionally consider to be at high risk of squamous gastric disease. But then when we talk about glandular gastric disease, we see much that much more in this sort of atypical squamous population. We see it in riding horses and horses with um, very different lifestyles. And the reason for that is that the risk factors that contribute to disease are different between the two diseases. And the cause of the two diseases is quite distinct as well, although we don't fully understand glandular, and we'll touch on that in a second. How we treat them is different and their response to treatment is different and the prevention strategies are very different too. And it's probably the last one as a horse owner that's most important because when we're conscientiously trying to prevent egus, we have to recognise that a lot of the time what we're actually effectively doing is trying to prevent squamous disease or in effect preventing squamous disease and if we want to prevent glandular disease, we have to add some additional, additional management strategies to that as well. Importantly, they're not related. They just happen to share the same room. And to me, they're kind of like the odd couple of the gastric world. So they happen to live side by side, but they have absolutely nothing to do with each other or very, very little to do with each other. And what that means is we can't extrapolate things about the risk factors, things about the treatment, things about the prevention from squamous disease to glandular disease. We need to specifically talk about both entities as distinct um, from each other. So what's squamous gastric disease? Well, squamous gastric disease includes primary disease, which is a disease that we see most commonly associated with management. And then very occasionally we'll see secondary squamous disease where we might have delayed gastric outflow and backlog of acid within the horse's stomach that builds up and splashes onto the squamous mucosa. We have a normal horse's stomach over here on the left, this nice sort of shiny white uh, this link line here, they're called the mugopicatus between the glandular mucosa, which is pink, and the squamous mucosa, which is yellow. And then as we start to expose that area to acid, to which it's not usually exposed to and not designed to be exposed to, we start getting uh, hyperkeratosis or thickening. And that's a little bit like the balls of your feet. If you start walking around with bare feet, uh, they're going to get thicker and rougher. That's just the natural response of skin or epithelium. If we continue to expose them, we'll start to see these small little focal ulcer type lesions. And then we can get across to these sort of Grade four lesions here, which are very deep, thick, uh, erosive and ulcerative lesions in the squamous mucosa, um, which are not uncommonly seen in certain populations of horses. Why does it occur? It's a relatively simple process, the, the, the pathophysiology of squamous disease. So we have an epithelium, uh, squamous epithelium, such as our, uh, in, in the horse's stomach, but would be the same as our esophagus or our skin and it doesn't like acid. So if we have acid that splashes up onto this mucosa, we get lesions. So it's a very straightforward relationship. We recognize that there's a role of different sorts of acids. Hydrochloric acid, which is produced by the, by the stomach is the dominant acid, um, it's extremely corrosive acid. But we also know that volatile fatty acids associated with the fermentation of grain in the stomach um, become a, a, an additional contributor and an additional risk factor for squamous disease. That said, we know that hydrochloric acid is the dominant agent because if we remove the hydrochloric acid with treatment with say omeprazole, then what effectively we get is that the ulcers will heal regardless of anything else that's going on. So um, it, in terms of treatment, it all becomes about hydrochloric acid. In terms of prevention, it comes, becomes about an interplay between the hydrochloric acid, it's splashing up, and then the additional component of grain diets and volatile fatty acids. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. 
So in the normal horse's stomach, what we have here is we have a, uh, this is the squamous mucosa in the top half of the stomach and the glandular mucosa sort of sits in this bottom half of the stomach. And we have our acid being secreted and accumulating around the bottom half of the stomach. And this is normally a highly acidic environment. But in the normal horse, horse's stomach, as we can see on the right here, what we have is basically effectively a ball of food. And if you look inside a horse's stomach that's um, eating out on pasture, or got unrestricted access to hay, effectively what you see is a large uh, basketball sized wad of food. And that wad of food does a couple of things. The wad of food has a buffering capacity so it can soak up acid and, and, and physically remove the acid. And the other thing that's really important is that wad of food physically creates a stratification of this acid so that um, the acid where it's produced stays down here and then as we get up higher, we have this higher pH. And so the, the pH stays very low around the glandular mucosa and the squamous mucosa under normal conditions is not designed to be exposed to a significant acid load. As the horse eats through the esophagus here, which comes in through here, as the horse eats, we also have a significant contribution of bicarbonate, uh, which is gonna be buffering out that acid. And so that creates this really nice layer of stratification. And what it means in effect is, is that this Margo placatus, which sits across about here, um, the pH of that's about four to five. And four is about the magic number. As we get below four, we start getting this corrosive effect. If we can stay above four, then we have a protective effect of the roughage. And this is why roughage is so important to the squamous mucosa and to the management of squamous disease and the reduction of squamous disease at a risk factor level or a management level. Another really important factor is exercise. And so this is looking at a pH trace inside a horse's stomach, just inside the, the, the esophagus there, um, which is basically just the sort of lower level of the squamous mucosa. And what we see here is under normal conditions, that pH with a horse that's eating roughage based diet, that pH is gonna sit around seven. So it's a nice protected buffered environment. We come along here with this is a horse that exercises on the treadmill. And we see that as it starts to exercise um, at a walk, uh, there's some effect, but as it starts to exercise a walk, that's moderate, relatively modest effect. But the moment the horse picks up a trot, um, the, the moment the horse picks up a trot, the pH in that part of the stomach dramatically decreases. And this is because the horse has contracted its abdominal muscles and physically squeezes the stomach like an hourglass and pushes the acid up from that ventral part up onto that sort of dorsal or mid region of the scrape and starts hitting the squamous mucosa. Important thing here is, is that the the degree, of, the degree of change in pH at this level at least is no difference between a trot or a gallop. So it's not how intensely you're working, it's how long that stays there for that's gonna cause the damage. And so we then see as we come back to a walk, it takes another sort of 15 minutes or so before that's gonna return back to normal. So it's how long we exercise our horses for that's the major contributory risk factor for squamous disease. And that period of exposure of that squamous mucosa to that increased acid load is dictated by how long we exercise horses for, not so much how many days a week or something like that. There's a cumulative effect though, obviously, if we do day after day. So very quickly, we can see that something like high intensity, short duration exercise or, uh, would be more less, less damaging to the stomach than medium intensity, long duration exercise, because it's not an intensity related thing, it's a duration related thing. And it's this mixing that's the problem. So as we start exercising, we start in this mixing, we get this acid that's splashing up uh, from an area that's normally protected against acid to an area that's not got any natural self-defense mechanisms beyond this normal roughage ball. Diet does play a role. And we know from much of the early work um, that very high carbohydrate diets will worsen the acid injury that's caused by the hydrochloric acid. We know that epidemiologically, the more grain we feed, the greater the risk of squamous gastric disease. But it's important to put that into context and to recognize that the grain per se and commercial processed feeds are not the devil. Sometimes in the conversation about equine gastric ulcer syndrome, they get demonized and they say, well, we can't feed our horse grain or we can't feed our horse processed feeds because it's got egus. It's about quantity, right? It's about um, if you have a glass of wine, it's fine, it's good for you. It, it actually has some beneficial effects. If you have three bottles of wine, it's bad for you. Um, it's the same thing with grain. So we know that particularly the commercial processed feeds that are balanced feeds, these are really important, important parts of the overall management of a, you know, a good healthy horse to have a balanced feed. And so we've, we've got to be careful of these statements that sort of take us all the way out and say, no, nah, we're not going to do this because uh, these very absolute statements. Moderation is the key. 
and moderation is the key when we start thinking about the use of you know grain based diets. But certainly we start favoring away from carbohydrate based diets because it's carbohydrate that ferments. So we start looking for high fat, high fiber diets as being the cornerstone of prevention strategies for squamous gastric disease. We can, in, we can to some degree at least counteract the impact of these diets by the appropriate roughage, particularly the timing of the roughage, making sure we have the roughage in the stomach before we exercise. And it's quantity that's really important. It's again, it's about moderation. We think that we've traditionally said that if a horse has uh, is at risk of ulcers, we put it in the pasture, the pasture is going to remove the risk of ulcers. And what's interesting is it only, only partially does that. So it may be that pasture, particularly lush green pasture, lacks the fibrous structure to really form that basketball size water food. And if you tend to look in horses, stomachs that are eating pasture, it tends to be much more slushy rather than a hay-based diet that's a much firmer water food. Um, it can also be related to things such as the timing of exercise. If you're exercising first thing in the morning where the horses have naturally been sleeping overnight um, and therefore have less roughage in their stomach, therefore less protection. If you exercise first thing in the morning before they've had a chance to re replenish that, then you're gonna have a higher risk of disease than if you're exercising a horse in the afternoon that's been out on pasture all day and has been able to establish that nice big ball of roughage in its stomach. So these are some of the things that we can play around with when we think about squamous gastric disease and risk factors. My experience is, is that in horses with, you know, very well managed riding horses and, and sports horses with very well managed diets with, with uh, generally do well despite a limited turnout. Turnout's not the cornerstone or the be all and end all of squamous gastric disease. And in fact, if we look at roughage consumption and stuff like that, which is the cornerstone of protection, horses that live in stalls, particularly horses that are habituated to stalls, um, you know, really probably have no greater risk or minimally greater risk than horses that live out on pasture. And that habituation though is important and it's the provision of roughage during that stall, stalling period that's the critical element. And it's something we've known about that, we've known about that for quite a long time. And so it's become a cornerstone recommendation and, and that reduced our overall prevalence of disease in those populations. So if we think about terms of squamous gastric disease in general, it's really to me, we can talk about, you know, there's a wide range of factors. There's things like the age of sex, um, sorry, the age of the horse, the sex of the horse. There's a whole bunch of things that might contribute disease or potentially do contribute to disease, but they're relatively small factors compared to the impact of diet and exercise. So particularly or specifically diet, uh, diet in terms of the amount of roughage, so having adequate roughage and not having excessive carbohydrate and the amount of exercise the horse does over any given period of time. And there's a relatively linear relationship between this where the risk of squamous disease increases as we increase the workload, the exercise and the intensity of management of any given horse. Individuals will vary within that, but the general trend is the same. When we get to a point where we put enough intensity on those, then we see very high rates of squamous disease. So in horses, um, some of our racehorse populations and some of our endurance horse populations that are under very intense lifestyles in terms of work and exercise and their management, then we see quite high rates of squamous disease accordingly. So here's a study just, or here's, here's a range of studies, sorry, just looking at this. What we have here in the blue is the squamous gastric disease and the red is the glandular gastric disease. And what we have here from left to right is just a range of studies. And we're really looking at horses um, from a relatively low relaxed lifestyle, uh, endurance horses at rest, sports horses moving across to warm bloods. And then we start getting across the thoroughbred race horses and the endurance horses in, in high intensity work. And both of these groups of horses are very much, um, you know, really elite athletes and they're performing uh, a range of physiological things under, under, you know, very high, high performance levels. And what we see is it's a relatively straight relationship as I just showed you, as we increase their intensity of lifestyle and their intensity of management, the expectations we have on them from a, from a physiological point of view, um, we see a corresponding increase in the risk of squamous gastric disease with our blue line going up here. Uh, fluctuates a little bit depending on the population we look at, but it's a fairly consistent effect across the board. So we know a lot about squamous disease and we're relatively comfortable with that because we've been looking at it for a long time. What about glandular disease? So glandular disease is something that's um, much, more, much newer to us and that we're really just starting to work our way through. It includes hyperemic erosive and ulcerative disease. And the reason why we use the terminology glandular gastric disease rather than glandular ulcer syndrome or glandular ulcers um, is that true ulceration is actually very rare. Most of these horses technically have 
um, erosive lesions, but they're not full thickness ulcers. So it's a little bit pedantic, um, but the terminology reflects that. So we have the normal pilaris of the horse, nice and pink and shiny. As we go down, as we start seeing different stages of disease, we might see this sort of mottled, slightly inflamed appearance, but the mucosa on this horse will be intact. And then we start seeing small discrete lesions. We come across to the right. This would be a lesion that we very commonly see in the bottom um, of the, the pylorus in a, in a performance horse, say a warm blood riding horse or a, a sports horse of some form. And that lesion across the bottom there is going to be about the size of my finger. So it's, a, it's quite a significant lesion. You can see it's quite a significant erosion to the surface that we've got some bleeding of that lesion as well. And then on the right hand side here, we have a very, very severe lesion, something we may see with severe phenylbutazone toxicity or something like that. Um, fortunately, we don't see too many of these ones on the right because that's, that's going to physically obstruct the outflow of this horse's stomach, and that's going to be a very significant problem for that horse. This lesion here, second from the right, is one that we see much more commonly, um, and it's the sort of when we talk about equine glandular gastric disease in general, these are the types of lesions that we're talking about. We don't really understand why these occur. What we know is, is that that part of the stomach is normally bathed in, in a very acidic concentration. So we're normally sitting with a pH of around one to two, um, but there's normal defense mechanisms. There's this very fine mucobicarbonate layer that buffers basically effectively between the lumen of the stomach and the actual lining of the stomach. So the lining of the stomach itself has got a pH of seven because it's protected by this very thin layer of mucus and bicarbonate. We believe there to be a breakdown of those normal defense mechanisms, particularly to that mucobicarbonate layer. Um, it makes sense. It's what happens in peptic ulcer disease in people, but we don't really understand the factors. We know we know that it's not Helicobacter, at least to date, we've been able, unable to show Helicobacter, which is the big factor in people. Um, and we know that there's um, lots of other things that it could be, but we really haven't been able to figure it out yet in terms of uh, specifically being able to put our finger on something. So as I said, um, we've got no evidence for the role of bacteria. So it makes it very different from, from peptic ulcer disease or gastric ulcers in people where helicobacter is a dominant cause. It's not the only cause, but it's a dominant cause, particularly in the Western world. non drugs such as phenidine and but, um, these do have the potential for toxicity in individual animals, especially when we use them at higher doses. So something like using but um, at that 4.4 you know, two grams twice a day for seven days, we know that can induce disease. Using them much more at, at normal label doses, um, toxicity is much less common. Um, and really the thing with, with these drugs is, is that we see very high prevalences of glandular gastric disease in some populations that don't have exposure to these drugs at all. So horses that may be in performance or competition environments just simply don't go on these drugs because of, of restrictions and yet still have high rates of disease. So. NZs can be a, a, a potential cause, but they're not explaining what we see as this general disease syndrome. The risk factors, you know, the epidemiological stuff is much less well described for, for glandular gastric disease. But what we do know is it's really inappropriate to say, well, we know these things such as diet and exercise that are really important to squamous disease. We can't apply them to glandular gastric disease because they're different. Um, and the problem with doing that is it gives us a false sense of security. We think, oh, well, we've done all the right things to prevent aegis. And in fact, we've left glandular disease out of the conversation and we still have a significant risk of glandular disease, particularly in the riding horse, sports horse populations. There's no effect of age, the sex of the horse or seasonality um, doesn't appear to be anything related to those sorts of factors. We have no data or minimal data to say that there's any role of diet and, and squamous gastric disease is predominantly a disease of diet. Glandular gastric disease is not a disease of diet. And we need to move past that when we think about prevention strategies and these sorts of things. And as I said, we tend, to, we tend to see this more commonly in the sports and riding horse populations. So they can occur in both and both can occur in all populations, but we still generally see squamous gastric disease primarily as a disease of race and racing and endurance horses. Um, these very high physiological performing, high exercising horses. Um, and we see glandular gastric disease much more commonly in the sports and riding horse population. So even horses with relatively uh, uh, sedentary lifestyles, um, we still got to see glandular disease. And certainly the average riding horse would be the classic horse that we see clinically relevant glandular gastric disease in, much more so than we would see squamous disease. What contributes to glandular gastric disease? So this is just a study where we looked at horses in the UK and we are looking at um, horses going through an abattoir um, that were that were feral, excuse me one second, 
um, when we're comparing feral horses and domesticated horses, and the, the domesticated is in blue and the ferals in red. On the left-hand side here, we've got the squamous gastric disease. And what we see is, is that we see an effect of domestication, right? So we have grade one, two, three, four lesions here, and we see that very few of the feral horses had squamous gastric disease, whereas we saw quite a significant number of the domesticated horses have squamous gastric disease. We also see the same effect in glandular gastric disease. So we see very few of the feral horses had glandular gastric disease and the, the domesticated horses had a relatively high rate of glandular gastric disease. The importance of that is, is that we do recognize that what it means is that it's core as an overarching statement, they're both diseases of management. Management does play a role, intensive lifestyle and the intensive management of these horses does play a role in increasing the risk of disease or the number of affected horses or percentage of affected horses. However, below that, the levels below that, below this overarching term of saying management, the, the specific levels or the specific factors are different um, in glandular than they are for squamous. So again, we look at this chart and we saw that the blue left to right was relatively linear. And what we see here is, is the red, which is glandular gastric disease, bounces around a lot more. There's not this relatively direct relationship between increasing exercise management intensity um, and you know, glandular gastric disease risk. And we actually see, uh, this is an Australian racehorse population where we see, uh, both of these are actually Australian racehorse populations where we see quite high rates of glandular disease and other racehorse populations not so high. We do see there is an effect. This is actually the same group of horses looked at different times. And we see that when we took them out of rest and put them into work, we doubled the, um, we doubled the, the squamous disease risk, but we also doubled the glandular disease risk, even though the overall risk was lower. Again, increasing that intensity of management does have an effect. It's just separate sub factors within that intensity of lifestyle. So what are they? Um, so we talked about exercise and the quantity of exercise being really important for squamous gastric disease. This is a study looking at warm bloods out of, of Canada. I'm sorry, not warm bloods, show jumpers out of Canada, the majority of which would be warm bloods, or they are warm bloods, sorry. Um, and what we saw and what they saw in this study was is that exercising, it's the number of days you exercise per week, independent of intensity or duration. So for squamous disease, it was duration and cumulative duration risk. For glandular disease, it's the number of days you exercise per week. And so in this study, they saw that horses that were exercising six or seven days per week had three and a half times the risk of glandular gastric disease than horses that were exercising five days a week or less, regardless of the intensity or the duration of the exercise. We did a similar study in an Australian UK racehorse populations, and we saw a very, very similar effect. And so what we saw was that horses were exercising five to seven days a week were 10 times more likely to have glandular gastric disease than horses that were exercising four times a week or less. And this was a multivariate analysis. So this was independent of a range of other factors that would be associated with increasing exercise, such as diet and these sorts of things. And so what it appears to be is, is that increasing the number of days of exercise per week increases the risk of glandular gastric disease. Put another way, the absence of rest days. And so when we think about management strategies for glandular gastric disease, the provision of rest days becomes one of our cornerstone strategies because the provision of at least two to three rest days per week appears to have a very dramatic impact on the risk of, of glandular gastric disease. We talked briefly about drugs like phenylbutazone, um, and phenylphenidine, phenylphenidine um, and this is just simply a study that looks at that and says um, on the left-hand side here, they've got squamous disease, the right-hand side, they've got glandular disease, and they're looking at furacoxib and phenylbutazone. Phenylbutazone is kind of the classic benchmark drug, furacoxib, a newer generation drug. What they're seeing is, is that we can induce both squamous disease, uh, which is probably primarily a topical toxic effect, and we can induce glandular disease um, in both these populations with relatively short durations of drug. And so this is something we probably have learned in the last five years, which traditionally we would have said five years ago, we were saying, well, we don't really see non steroidal toxicity at the doses we use the drugs like normal. Uh, we see them when we overdose the drugs. What we're seeing here is, is that we do see toxicity with both phenylbutazone and ferrocoxib, but to a lesser degree with ferrocoxib when we use them over that sort of standard 10 day treatment period. Even as little as seven days, we recognize that these horses will develop lesions. A lot of these lesions are mild and self-limiting. Um, once we stop the drug, they go away. We're going to talk about that in a second because we're going to talk about what role maybe uh, we need to do to prevent these or whether we, whether we should even be doing that because um, traditionally we've put these horses on a meprazole, 
to prevent their risk of disease while they're on non-steroidals, but that may actually not be a smart thing to do. So what about stress? So squamous gastric disease, there's minimal evidence, you know, stressy horses get ulcers or stressy people get ulcers. Um, there's actually minimal evidence to support the role of stress in squamous gastric disease. It's not a stress-related disease, not in this sort of uh, mindset idea. It's more of a physiological stressor or the lifestyle uh, intensity of lifestyle stressor. But the behavioral stress is not really a, a factor in squamous gastric disease. But we have a growing body of evidence that stress is a central factor in glandular gastric disease, which is the glandular gastric disease is much more like peptic ulcer disease in people, whereas squamous gastric disease is similar to to reflux esophagitis and these sorts of things in people. So we do have a growing body of evidence that stress plays an important role in the glandular gastric disease of the horse. So the question is, what is stress? You know, do horses study for exams? Are they worried about their appearance? Uh, you know, what's the definition of stress for a horse? And we've already looked at, at exercising and exercising frequently. That may be a form of, of stress for the horse. There may also be things to do with blood supply and those sorts of things that are affected by by frequent exercising, whereas rest days provided, provide some protection. So this study here is out of Switzerland, and what they're looking at is, um, they're looking at the response of horses to ACTH. So ACTH uh, is, is, we give it to horses, it stimulates the release of cortisone, which is the stress hormone. Um, and we're looking at horses here with glandular gastric disease and horses without glandular gastric disease. And what I see here is the horses in the white, these are horses without glandular gastric disease. What you see here is when they do this exactly the same test to horses with glandular gastric disease, you get an exaggerated response. Um, you get a greater release of cortisol and these horses are more stress primed. Now, whether that's chicken or egg is unclear at this stage. So is it the stress that's causing the, the ulcers or the, the lesions, the glandular lesions, or is it the glandular lesions that are then making these horses more stressy because they're sort of, they're uncomfortable and therefore they're responding in an exaggerated way. We don't know, but what we see is a relatively clear link or a relatively clear point that that these horses that with glandular gastric disease do have an exaggerated stress response and respond differently to stress stimuli than normal horses. Uh, one of the other really big risk factors is being a warm blood, the, the, you know, being a warm blooded, a warm blood horse, um, the breed, not the, not, you know, not the warm blood, cold blood, um, but being a warm blood horse, you know, if you're a warm blood horse in this study in, in the Finnish population and really what they're looking at in Finland are warm blood horses, standard bred horses, and um, these Finnish cold blood horses, and when you look at that population, warm blood horses were nearly 30 times more likely than the other groups of horses to have glandular gastric disease. Now that comes back to another question, is, that a, is, that a, um, is there a genetic predisposition for those horses? So is the warm blood breed genetically predisposed or is it related to the inherent behavior of warm blood breeds? So warm blood breeds tend to have this very sensitive, responsive type nature. Um, is it related to that? And we don't know is the answer at this stage. What's missing from this study is the thoroughbreds. Um, where does the thoroughbred fit into this? And my feeling is it's probably somewhere in the middle, um, but it's probably closer to the warm blood style response in terms of the risk of disease. And I think it's that similar behavioral sensitivity that these horses have um, that, that, that put them in that behavioral category of an increased risk there. Other things we saw, they saw in this study, um, they weren't quite statistically significant, but I think they're still worth looking at because they're quite a consistent effect, was the number of caretakers. So the more people we had looking after the horses, the more risk they were at glandular gastric disease. And the number of riders also increased the risk um, of glandular gastric disease. And I think for a warm blood, that's a relatively easy story to make, or for a riding horse, it's a relatively easy story to make because we train these horses to be very sensitive to, 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 to pressure um, and they're adaptive response, the way we train them is to release from pressure and move away from pressure. And if we change the rider, we're asking the horse to interpret a different set of signals. Someone's pressing the button slightly differently. And if the horse can't find a release, we could see quite quickly how that could be a, a behaviorally stressful event. Um, and so recognizing how we train these horses, recognizing um, that when we change riders, that has an impact on their horse's ability to find the release and to find that sort of stress-free zone um, potentially is one of the factors as we understand this disease. And it's one of the things that we implement in horses that we know have an ongoing problem with disease is to try and reduce these factors um, as much as possible in any individual horse. The last thing we see is, is it really important? You know, we, we're still trying to put together, you know, we know these diseases are highly prevalent. How important are they in the population? Um, for me, squamous gastric disease is primarily the horse version of heartburn. 
Uh, it does affect performance, but it really particularly affects appetite and food intake and stuff like that. And so we see issues with maintaining weight and these sorts of things. For glandular gastric disease, we see some of that. I think personally, I think we see a higher risk of colic associated with glandular gastric disease than we do with squamous gastric disease. And the other thing that we see with glandular gastric disease that becomes very important when we talk about the context of our performance horses is that we see decreased performance. So in this show jumper study, they saw that horses that were competing at an international level were nine times less likely to have glandular gastric disease than horses that were competing at the national level in the study they looked at. So one possibility is, is that the horses that had the ability at national level but had glandular disease, it was the glandular disease that was one of the contributory factors stopping them from going on to be elite performers. The other possibility is that we know it's a disease of behavioural stress, is those horses that are competing at the international level may be more adapted to their lifestyle than horses that are competing at the national level. The international horses tend to live on the road and that's their life and they're very adapt. We know that horses are very, very adaptable. Uh, the national horses tend to move from uh, their home environment to a show environment back to a home environment and that may be much more stressful for those horses. So again, is it chicken or egg? We can't really say, but we do see a relatively clear distinction here between those two populations and the horses with disease overall performing at a significantly lower level. Again, we saw a similar thing in our um, study that we looked at Australian racehorses. The nice thing about these two studies is they came out about the same time, very different populations, but very, very similar findings. And so it really gives us confidence that we're on the right track and we're talking about the right thing here. So we asked in this study, we simply asked the trainers, um, was the horse racing at above or below expectation before we did the gastroscopy? And the, independent of everything else, horses that were racing below expectation were nearly four times more likely to have glandular gastric disease. So I think this disease is, is, a, is a really significant impact on the, you know, the ability of the horse to perform to expectation. We know that gastric pain has similar effects in elite human athletes, um, increased time, uh, sorry, decreased time to exhaustion, a range of physiological things that go on. So, um, so recognizing both squamous and, and glandular disease can contribute to, to poor performance either directly through uh, these sorts of factors or indirectly through changes in appetite and ability to maintain weight, recover between races or events and these sorts of things. Take home messages from this part of the talk is, is that you know, when we talk about squamous gastric disease, we talk about glandular gastric disease, what we know about one, we can't apply to the other. And so when we, we want to talk about this conversation about prevention and stuff like that, we need to broaden the conversation beyond what we've traditionally recognized for the last 10 to 15 years. Squamous disease is a primarily disease of domestication and intensive management. And yet we see glandular disease, also a disease of domestication, but we see it relatively high prevalence in our traditional low risk groups. So um, particularly our sports and riding horses, especially the warm bloods. And I think to some degree that the off the track thoroughbreds or the retired thoroughbreds are also fall into that category. Glandular disease is not a disease of diet. So, we can reduce the carbohydrate, increase the roughage, which are very important management strategies for squamous disease, but it's not gonna change the difference to glandular disease. We need to do things like make sure we've got rest days, reduce behavioral stress, these sorts of factors to reduce the risk of glandular disease. So what else have we learned in the last five years? That, you know, that sort of gives us a context. Um, this is some work that I did. This is my PhD work, uh, which was sponsored by the Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation very generously. And we were looking at omeprazole, and by this time, omeprazole had been used in the horse for sort of nearly 15 years. Uh, it's one of the most widely used drugs in the horses. But it was remarkable how little we actually understood the factors that were affecting this. So what we wanted to do in this study, we wanted to look at the, um, the impact of diet and what different doses would do on how the, the drug affected acid suppression in the horse's stomach. So we had horses with these little, little tubes inserted in their stomach. And through that, this, this is sitting in the very bottom part of the stomach, about sort of two inches from the bottom of the stomach. We could insert a pH probe and we could measure at the mucosa and deep in the ingester. And we could measure over a 24 hour period like this trace here. So we could measure, you could see it's very low. This is a horse that was on a sort of a racehorse diet eating two big meals a day. We can see with each meal, there's a, a bump in the intragastric pH and it goes back down to very low. And so we wanted to use this study and look at omeprazole. So we used um, Gastrogard, which is the formulation most commonly used internationally. And we looked at it at the, um, the, the prevention dose, quote unquote prevention dose of one mg per kg and the treatment dose of four mg per kg by mouth once a day. Looked at it over a five day period because there's a cumulative effect over time. And we wanted to compare the impact of diet. So we looked at free choice hay, which is the standard recommendation for prevention. 
and a proxy of a racehorse diet of what we'd see in Australia, which is horses eating about 1% of their body weight in grain um, and 1% of their body weight in, in hay uh, split into two meals. And we followed these horses over six days from a baseline day and day one to five. What we saw was there was a significant impact of, of particularly of diet. And so this has really changed the way we think about this. It's a little bit busy here, but what we have here is four mg per kg is red, one mg per kg is blue. The individual triangles are individual horses, the individual circles are individual horses. And then at the top there, we have when, we've, when we have the horses fasted overnight, and then we give the imeprazole and we waited two hours before feeding them. And on the bottom here, we have the horses getting unrestricted access to hay, which would be the standard recommendation. What we see is when we fast the horses overnight, what we're looking at here as an outcome is the percentage of time that we spend above this pH of four. So we said four was the magic number for, for damage to occur. So we wanna be above four for as much of the day as possible. Um, and we ideally wanna be above four from a treatment perspective for about 60, 67% of the time, two thirds of the day. So what we saw is in this ventral part of the stomach is that four mg per kg, when we fasted the horses overnight, they had an empty stomach and we gave the drug. At four mg per kg, we got a very rapid and consistent acid suppressive response. Although we do see some individual horses having a relatively less pronounced response than, than most of the horses here. So that potentially explains the variability we see in treatment response. This is no great surprise. This is kind of what we expected the drug to do. As we reduce the drug to the prevention dose, we see a much more variable effect. So we start to see these horses that have low drug absorption starting to drop off like these guys here, and our average effect is much less, less predictable. Although there are some horses that still respond very, very well. So much more in the individual level response thing here. But we're sitting around, on average, we're sitting around about that 60% mark, that one mid per kg. So none of that was a particularly great surprise. What was surprising was when we moved to the uh, hay-based diet, remembering that we've said that hay-based diets are the cornerstone of management, managing squamous gastric disease risk, what we saw was is the efficacy of the drug dropped off dramatically. So we don't see a big difference here. In fact, there was no statistical difference between the two doses, which is interesting, although it does appear to be some difference. But what we see really importantly is, is that the average effect is well below our threshold, our healing threshold. And so um, we're down around the 40% mark. We have individual horses that still respond well, but then we have some individual horses that show minimal, if any, response. And that's really important because for years we've said what you need to do is to reduce the risk of squamous disease is give ad limits of hay, and then we're going to treat the disease at the same time. And what this shows is that we can't do that. Um, we reduce the availability of the drug or the absorption of the drug by uh, sort of 50 to 65% when we do that, and that has a really significant impact on the amount of acid suppression that we're, we're able to achieve, particularly in the bottom part of the stomach when we talk about glandular disease. So what that's meant is, is that we fundamentally change the way we, we, we manage these horses. And so when we're going through the treatment phase, we somewhat counterintuitively, we starve these horses overnight from 10 o'clock onwards. We make sure they've got an empty stomach. We give the drug. We wait around about 60 minutes, anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. We then feed the horse and we then provide it with its roughage during the day. And then we repeat the cycle overnight. And that's dramatically, that, that has a really big impact on the amount of acid suppression we can get with the drug. And, and for this drug, it's as simple as the more acid suppression, the better. And so it shifts us from this relatively modest, unpredictable response to this very good, very, very predictable response when we make that management change. And that's been a big shift in, in the last five years about how we use the drug um, in terms of treating horses around the world. And that's been something, as I said, that was you know, very generously supported by Grayson. What else have we learned? Well, we've started to look at other treatments. We've recognized that these glandular gastric disease doesn't heal the same way as, squam same way as squamous gastric disease. Squamous gastric disease with the meprazole therapy, we generally get 70 to 80% response rates in the first month, which is really pretty good. Um, we still have some non-responders and we need to think about those in a different way. But what we recognized quite early on was glandular gastric disease wasn't healing the same way. And that's why I um, started doing research. I, was a, a, I am an equine clinician. My clinics are sort of my day-to-day -day thing. But there was this fundamental problem that we were treating these horses and their glandular disease wasn't resolving. And that's where I set off down on my research path trying to solve this problem. And we, we've made some progress. So we've started to look at other drugs like mesoprostol um, instead of a metrazole. Um, traditionally, we combine a metrazole with sacrolfate for glandular gastric disease. And in this particular study, they showed that mesoprostol was better than a metrazole sacrolfate combination. And so um, they had both treatments were able to improve the horses, <clears throat> but when they went to healing, um, they saw that um, the omeprazole sacrolfate, so gray is healed, uh, black is unhealed, 
uh, was in, was not as good as the mesoprostol. And so mesoprostol has become, based on this study, has become widely used um, as a frontline treatment for glandular gastric disease. Meprazole primarily still for squamous gastric disease, mesoprostol for glandular gastric disease. Although we still use omeprazole sacrophate, and now we've got better at using omeprazole um, because of these changes in diet. And important to recognize that in this study, they didn't have those changes in diet because it sort of preceded that knowledge. Um, so the omeprazole was a little bit hampered in its ability to do its job, because we still have omeprazole sacrophate and mesoprostol. The key message here is we're treating them differently. We recognize that they respond differently, so we recognize that we need to treat them differently. What else have we done? Well, we started to move forward. So this is some follow on. This is some of my postdoc work um, after, after my PhD work. And so what we started doing was looking at new formulations. We recognized that the oral formulation worked well under certain conditions, but when we started putting things like, you know, horses on pasture or giving them unrestricted access to hay, which is something that we really want to do for them for management reasons, not just for their stomach, for their entire gut health and also for behavioral and welfare reasons, uh, we started recognizing the drug didn't work as well as it should. So we started looking at new formulations and this is a particular formulation, not currently commercially available in the US, um, but is, is, is on the way. Um, and we're looking at um, a long acting injectable formulation. So basically a once a week injection of uh, a 20 mil dose of, of the semeprazole formulation and what sort of impact it had. And we used the same horses from my PhD that were, were part of that original Grayson study. And so what we did was we had a single dose, um, so about two grams, um, which is, is a, still a relatively modest dose of omeprazole overall, but because we're giving it systemically, uh, we're gonna get a much greater uptake of the drug. We looked just at the free choice hay diet because we know that this is the diet that, that struggles the most. And we followed these horses over a seven day period. And what we saw was, is we got very rapid acid suppression, we got very pronounced acid suppression for four days. And then we start getting a little bit of variable acid suppression over that five to seven day period but we're still seeing acid suppression over the course of the week that's above our threshold of four for at least two thirds of the time, even in these relatively low responder horses. So this encourages us to look at this further. And what we did was we took and we looked at thoroughbred horses in training. We had 24 horses complete the study. Um, we looked at squamous and glandular mucosa separately. We had 12, 22 horses with squamous disease, 12 with glandular disease, 10 had both. Um, and then we gave them two doses of this injectable omeprazole on day zero and day seven. And we checked them again in two weeks. Most of the horses at 14 days, one horse at 16 days because of its racing schedule. Uh, it was very well tolerated, which is always encouraging when you start using a new formulation. And even more encouraging was that what we saw was we saw a very, very strong response rate. So what we saw was once we got this very marked acid suppression, we had 100% squamous healing. And this is very good compared to sort of our traditional benchmark of this 70 to 85% mark using the oral formulation. When we look at glandular gastric disease, again, we had a very good response. Over that two week period, we had a 75%, relatively small number of horses, but we had 75% of these horses that, um, that responded and healed. And that compares with some studies I've done in that population with oral omeprazole, where we were only getting around about 25% healing over a four week period. So this was, this was really exciting because as I said, my original sort of, reason was I started being a clinician because we were struggling to heal this glandular gastric disease. And then all of a sudden we're, you know, well, not all of a sudden, because it takes some years of work, but we were able to work through it. And we were able to come up with a, with a new tool and a new option for treating this very refractory and difficult disease. And, and we're still getting this response rates around the 75, 80% with this formulation when we're using it um, in certain clinical populations. So that's really, really encouraging um, and meaning that we, you know, we've been able to make major inroads into a, a very difficult disease to manage. This is just looking at the overall scores. So we had horses with you know, moderate to severe disease in squamous and complete resolution. And we had horses with moderate to severe disease in glandular and they all improved to some degree um, and we had the majority of them heal. So again, something that's in the pipeline that's, that's really, really encouraging. Okay, so where do we, that's what we've known in the last five years. The next question is, we've started in that same time period is to start to look at the other side of the coin. We've got much better at using the drug therapeutically. We've got much better at getting better acid suppression and getting better, better therapeutic outcomes. But we've also started to ask the question about side effects. And we've got a little bit of data here, and this is where we're starting to move. This is, what's, this is what we need to look at in the next five years, in my opinion. And these are the sorts of questions that we're asking as researchers um, as, we, as we look into this sort of thing. So 
Uh, what do we see? Well, this is a study looking at some of the things that we know so far. This is a study looking in foals. And what they basically saw was when they gave these foals acid suppressive drugs, and it didn't matter whether it was a meprazole, ranitidine, sacrolfate, any drug basically that impairs gastric acidity, um, there was an increased risk of these foals developing diarrhea. And so it was nearly double the risk if they gave the drug rather than if they didn't get the drug, regardless of all these other multivariate factors that were going on. And that's probably because normal gastric acidity has an important protective role in the, in the, in the gastrointestinal tract and systemic immune system as well. And so um, we recognize this is in neonates, so this is less than 14 days of age. The risk of this is less, much less of a concern in adult horses, although it's something that we don't quite know. We don't really know how much long-term, in fact, we don't know whether long-term omeprazole therapy impacts on the microbiota of the horse's gut. We know the microbiota is critical for a whole range of reasons, not the least of which is diarrhea risk, um, but we don't know that whether uh, long-term omeprazole therapy has an impact. We know that short-term therapy is well-tolerated, has minimal, if any, impact, but we don't know about long-term therapy. So it's one of the current questions that we're asking. But we do have evidence here that we do have an effect in some populations, and this is consistent with what you see in human medicine. We talked before about um, you know, the potential for non steroidal drugs like the furacoxib, phenylbutazone to cause equine glandular gastric disease particularly, but to cause both squamous and gastric disease. And so for many years, we've recommended the concurrent administration of omeprazole to treat those ulcers or prevent those ulcers alongside the use of those drugs. It's a really interesting study that came out in the middle of this year from the group at Tennessee. And what they saw was um, they were looking at exactly this. They were saying, well, if we put the horses on phenylbutazone, do they get disease? If we put them on phenylbutazone and omeprazole, do we stop the disease from occurring? And the answer was yes and no. So when they put the horses on uh, phenylbutazone, they developed glandular gastric disease, and that would be expected, although it should note that they used quite a high dose of phenylbutazone in this study. When they put the horses on phenylbutazone and omeprazole, the omeprazole was able to block the phenylbutazone-induced glandular gastric disease. So that was a positive. But what they saw was, is that the horses that received both phenylbutazone and omeprazole had more overall complications. And out of their eight horses, this included two fatalities. So some quite serious complications um, throughout the rest of the gastrointestinal tract. And so the idea that omeprazole only changes what goes on in the stomach, it's where its mechanism of action is, um, is, not, is not true. What we see is, clear potential for it to affect other parts of the gastrointestinal tract. And this is consistent in other, other species where we see widespread intestinal inflammation associated with changes in gastric acidity from a meprazole treatment. So this study has meant that we've pretty much pulled back on that recommendation. And the current recommendation, at least as I see it, is that if we're giving these non steroidal drugs, we should give them appropriately, but we should give them judiciously, but we shouldn't be concurrently administering a meprazole because the risk of widespread gastrointestinal disease outweighs the benefit of reducing the risk of the glandular gastric disease, which would likely be self-limiting in many of these horses anyway. So the really fundamental change in one of our recommendations um, that we've had for a good 15 years now and completely reversed that recommendation, at least as, as far as I see it, based on you know, very new data. Um, we also see one of the other populations that we tend to use, we like to use, or traditionally maybe use the meprazole in, is horses that have been weaned and they go, we know they go through this stressful period. We know they go through a diet adaptation period. We know there's behavioral stress imposed on these horses. So, um, you know, it was a recommendation for some time that we'd put these horses on a meprazole to prevent them getting gastric ulcers during this period. This study, it's a slightly older than our five year window. But what this study showed was that putting these horses on a meprazole didn't necessarily have any impact on uh, weight gain. But what it did do was cause inflammation of the mucosa and actually cause lesions in some of these horses in the glandular mucosa. So again, the recommendation shifted from we can put these horses on it because there appears to be a lot of benefit and no risk to saying, well, actually, that's not entirely true. We still recognize these drugs have clear benefit therapeutically. But when we start thinking about prevention strategies and these sorts of things, we become much less confident that the risk benefits in favor of using the drug because we start to see these unrecognized risks before. So again, I, I personally don't recommend the use of omeprazole in weaning horses, in weanling horses that are otherwise healthy. If the horse develops clinical signs of, of equine gastric ulcer syndrome, then I go ahead and treat that horse. It's really important to say, it's not we use the drug or don't use the drug. It's our, third, it's our point at which we, we pull the trigger and we decide that it's gonna get more benefit than risk. Uh, 
but if we're just sort of this, this nebulous background juice, I don't think is something is something that we've really started to move away from. Other things that happen over time, um, what we have relatively limited data on is the long-term use of omeprazole. So we've got quite good data of using omeprazole, oral omeprazole over that sort of 28 day period, 28 to 35 day period, but we've got relatively limited data on using the drug over a long-term period. And there's only uh, three studies that I know of that looked at this, uh, four studies, sorry, uh, that have looked at this and basically all have shown that as we change to prevention doses, we get a drop off in therapeutic response. This one's the, the, the most significant. Um, so what we're looking at here is horses in the omeprazole group. Um, and if they're looking at um, uh, treatment response improvement, uh, about 43% of the horses, which is a relatively no number to start with. Um, so there are some concerns over sort of the overall structure um, of, of this data, but, but it is consistent with things we see elsewhere. And by 30 days, in 60 days, that's a relatively consistent effect. And then by 90 days, it starts dropping off. So between 60 and 90 days, our effect appears to start dropping off. And we've seen that in other studies where we've dropped the dose from this treatment dose back to prevention dose. We see about 20% of horses develop new lesions when we do that. So uh, we can't just drop from the treatment dose, prevention dose and assume that we're getting you know, an overall good response. And that's recognizing our initial response might be in the 70 to 80% range. And then we drop down 20% from that when that 50 to 70% range. So all of a sudden we're at horses, you know, that a little bit over half to, to two thirds of them are responding, meaning that a third to a half of them uh, are suboptimally responding with those changes in dose, but also with the long-term duration. Why is this the case? Well, we need to look at this further, but there's one study that sort of supports this. And what they're looking at here is the pharmacokinetics of the drug. And it's the area under the curve. It's this area here that's the determinant of omeprazole efficacy. What you can see here is same omeprazole, same horses, same dose on day one had a much greater area under the curve than on day 29. It's about a 50% reduction in area under the curve. And we know this drug's metabolized by the liver and then that metabolism's upregulatable. So what we're probably seeing is over time is upregulation of drug metabolism and decreased efficacy over time. What we don't know is what happens when we take these horses out to two months or three months. And what we don't know is how long this effect lasts for. So that's the sort of questions we're asking in the next five years. Other things that go on, um, in humans coming, when you come off a omeprazole therapy, one of the things that happens is you suppress the gastric acidity is you get this buildup of stimulus for acid production because uh, the body says, well, we're not making acid, we need to make more. So it makes more gastrin. Gastrin is the key stimulus for gastric acid production. And so when you come off a omeprazole, it's quite common in humans, about 20 to 40% of people coming off these drugs get rebound gastric hyperacidity, which in humans is manifested as very severe heartburn. Um, and so we, we haven't really recognized this horse till relatively recently. Again, another study from this year. And what they were looking at was horses over a 14 day period, um, two different diets, calcium sources here. So the diet didn't have an impact, but the horses that didn't receive omeprazole maintained this baseline gastrin concentration and the gastrin concentration effectively doubled in the horses that got omeprazole over a 24 hour period. There's another study that's just come out very recently that says that, that effect appears to be relatively short lived if we only give them for, you know, for that 14 day period. But again, what we don't know is what happens is when we give them for 30 days or two months or three months, what's happening to this gastrin feedback loop. And there are other changes that go on in the stomach with hyperplasia of enterochromaffin like cells and these sorts of things that happen. The longer we use the drug, the more we see these, these structural changes, not just functional changes associated with, with hormone signaling. And so this is another question that we need to know a not, lot more about in the next five years. And, and we need to know what happens. We need to know how long it lasts for. And then the next question from that is, is what can we do to prevent it? In humans, they use tapering. Um, so they reduce the dose progressively over time. Uh, is that something we should be doing in horses? We don't know at this stage, um, but it's a, you know, it's a very, very valid question. The other side of this study was they looked at calcium absorption. And we'll talk about that in, in a minute when we talk specifically about the risk of fractures. Um, but they looked at calcium absorption and they saw that omeprazole in this particular study did reduce the, the apparent calcium digestibility of both the limestone and this marine calcium, although the marine calcium was less severely affected. And so when we start thinking about the potential risk for fractures, uh, which becomes a very big conversation, then we, you know, we have some provisional evidence here that says we do have uh, a, a mechanistic reason why this might occur. And I think in the next five years, that's the single biggest question that we need to answer in the omeprazole world is what's the risk associated with, with its use, particularly given its high prevalence of its use in, in some of our high performance populations. 
So the, the fractures themselves, so we don't have any data in horses on fractures. We don't have anything to say that it increases fracture risk, um, but it's quite a hard thing to study. And it's important to recognize that the, the, even in human medicine, it's still somewhat controversial. Traditionally in human medicine, we've said it's been geriatrics. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Geriatrics on long-term treatment. So we've got geriatric patients with pre pre-existing bone disease like osteoporosis. Um, and then we have them on long-term treatment. We deplete their vitamin B12 reservoirs from their liver, and then they get an increased risk of fractures. In the last few years though, we've started to shift that healing. Again, this is a July, 2019 study. And this, some of this was triggered by a conversation between myself and Grayson Jockey Club and something that we're really, really keen to look at from a research perspective. But these were looking at children uh, less than one year of age. And a lot of these studies are done in the military because they've got really good records of these kids over time. Um, and so these children less than one year of age that received acid suppressive drugs compared to kids that didn't receive acid suppressive drugs. And they followed these kids out for a sort of a 12, 13 year period, uh, which is, and looked at their overall risk of fracture. So any fracture, of these kids without predisposing disease, what was the likelihood these kids would break a bone over the next sort of 12 years of their life? And what they saw was, it was there was a clear impact of either the use of PPIs or the PPIs and the H2 receptor antagonists um, so ranitidine, these sorts of drugs, um, and increasing fracture risk. And when you use them together, they're even worse. And they saw this with treatment doses of less than 30 days. So very short duration treatment had a very pronounced effect on long-term fracture risk. The increased fracture risk was about 13%. And that's irrelevant because if we think about this in terms of horses, if we're looking at a population of horses for a drug that we widely use, we'd say, well, surely we would have recognized this by now. And the answer is not necessarily because an increased fracture risk of you know, 10 to 20%, when we think about the background factors, there's a range of things that contribute to fracture risk, increasing that by 20% would be significant or even by 10% would be significant, but we wouldn't necessarily be able to put our finger on the specific factor because we know there's a whole bunch of other things like track surfaces and training, possibly bisphosphonates, these sorts of things that play contributory roles. It's also important to think about not just terms of catastrophic fractures in terms of, you know, these which, which have very big impact um, on the on the on our sport or and the welfare of animals in our sport, but also on other diseases of bone remodeling. So diseases like shin soreness, third carpal bone disease, these sorts of things, uh, pod lesions in the in the in the in the cannon bones. These are the sorts of lesions that we associate with maladaptive bone remodeling. Um, and they're, 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 in many ways, they're the same core processes that are going on to cause these catastrophic fractures. So it's not just necessarily the catastrophic fractures that we may be contributing to the risk of, it may be these maladaptive disease processes as well. And that contributes really, those diseases have a major role, both in the cost of racing, but also in wastage in the sport. And, and wastage in the sport is a, is a really significant um, social license issue as well that, that we all need to sort of understand and address. So this data from humans says that, you know, there's potentially of concern here. And what it certainly has done is made, you know, made us start to think even more about not using these drugs in foals, moving away from using these drugs in foals when their skeletons are really young and really developing. What happens as they get a little bit older, which may be a, more applicable to our horse in racing population. So this is a, another study um, about five years old now, this study, and it was looking at young adults from four years of age through to 18 years of age. Uh, or, or adolescents, sorry, and then young adults from 18 to 29 years of age. So very much by about 30 years of age in humans, your, skelet your skeletons form. So very much the young horse to, to mature racehorse population that we talk about um, in, in, in our world. And so what we saw here was um, it varied a little bit in the statistical analysis and, and whether it was present in the univariate or multivariate, but we saw a relatively consistent effect here. And again, the, relatively, the relative risk was increased by about you know, 20 to 40% in these horses. When they corrected for it, it came back down to around about that 13% mark in this adolescent population. So we're seeing quite enough, and this was again, followed these kids out over um, you know, a minimum of a five year period. So it's not the immediate risk, it's, there is a cumulative risk and the risk increases over time. Sorry, I just, whoop. Um, the risk increases over time. So the more often we give these drugs, the higher the risk we see here, um, the more we give them over time, uh, to some degree, there's an increase of risk, although it's not as obvious. It appears to be a little bit more. So even short duration treatment may be associated with a significant and prolonged increased risk of disease. So I think, as I said, in the next five years, this is, this is probably the biggest question we need to try and answer from a research point of view.
we should not forget that these drugs are very useful for the treatment of a really important disease in our, in our population, but equally we shouldn't be blind to the potential for side effects and we need to balance that risk and that benefit. And to do that, we need to have a deep understanding of both sides of the coin. We've got a pretty good understanding of the therapeutic benefit of these drugs. We now are in a position where we need to start to develop a much deeper understanding of the potential risks of using these drugs. Uh, how is this potentially, just to finish up, how does this potentially, you know, play to bone disease? Um, so these are the mechanisms that are proposed in people. It's not fully understood in people, but we talked about vitamin B12 absorption, and this is the traditional approach in, in sort of geriatric people. We, we have a lot of vitamin B12 in our liver, so and horses make vitamin B12 in their hindgut. So we really shouldn't have this as a major issue in the horse, although the hindgut in some of our horses because of hindgut disease, which is a story for another day, um, may not be functioning normal, may not be making as much vitamin B12 as it should, but we're, we're less worried about that. What we do have from that study I showed you earlier, that provisional study, is that we do have preliminary evidence that we cause, in fact, we've now got two studies that show an increase in gastrin, and what increased gastrin does is increase histamine, and it stimulates the osteoclast, and the osteoclast are the, the cells that eat bone as part of the bone turnover. So we get increased bone resorption more than we have bone formation, we have an increased fracture risk. We also got some preliminary evidence that we have changes in calcium and magnesium, or at least calcium availability, and we need to look at magnesium availability, and these have similar effects as well. So these are the sorts of questions that we need to answer, and this, is, this half of the curve is where our current research activities are looking to focus um, going forward in, in the next cycle of research. And then just to finish up there, uh, sorry, went slightly over time, uh, but just to finish up there, um, this goes back to 2015, we released the consensus statement. This is an article that you can download for free. You just stick it into Google, uh, Google or Google Scholar. Um, you just stick in the, the, the title here and it's a free download, it's a free access article and it covers um, all the terminology in the front half of the lecture. So um, a lot of the front half of the stuff is well covered in this. What we've learned in the last five years is sort of where we need to sort of come to an update or where we need to add a bit more information before we update is um, some of the, ther the treatment side of things, um, which uh, you know, I've got some publications on. My email address is up the top there. I'm always happy to answer questions um, and, and sort of educate around this process. Um, and then as we learn more, we're gonna continue to sort of, we're gonna continue to sort of publish and, and get the information out there and continue to try and have these conversations. So with that, I'd like to thank you for the time. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation again. Um, all of my research wouldn't have happened without their support. Um, it was, it's put me personally in a position to, to you know, have these conversations and to you know, take an education role uh, and something I've been enormously appreciative of. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, ben, thanks so much for your time this morning. I know that... Uh... <clears throat> It's not easy. Uh, do, I know you have a lot of commitments and uh, we appreciate you doing this for us. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, just uh, use the software at the bottom of the page. You can hit Q&A. Uh, and I have a few questions that have already been submitted. If some, they have some others, we'll take them. Not in any particular order, I don't think, but just how they come. And the first one is, do you find horses that have had colic surgery are generally more predisposed to egos? So... Um, it's a, it's a, the link between egus and colic is a, is a good question. Um, we have some early work that shows a link between squamous disease and the horse having a history of colic, uh, you know, having had colic recently. Um, we don't have that evidence for glandular disease yet, but I think that, um, I think that my clinical impression is there is a significant link, particularly in that warm blood population I worked in, in Europe working with warm bloods, I, I think that was one of the real contributors to, to colic risk that we see. I think when we talk about colic, we need to separate, when we talk about surgical colic, we need to separate uh, structural lesions. So we have old horses that get lipomas and these sorts of things. And they're sort of a, uh, a random event for want of a better term, it's a numbers game. And then we have a lot of the lesions we see, particularly in those big warm blood horses, um, the big thoroughbreds, we see a lot of large colon lesions. And so we'll see, and I think it's a full spectrum. I think we need to separate surgical colic. Well, actually not separate surgical colic. We need to think about colic in terms of anything that affects the hind gut of the horse. So it could be a gas colic. It could be a spasmodic colic. It could be an impaction colic. It could be a displacement. It could be a nephrosplenic. could be a torsion, sort of on a continuum from sort of mild to severe. They're all fundamentally diseases 
I've changed gastrointestinal function, changed gastrointestinal motility, and typically excess gas production. So anything that affects the hindgut, such as diet um, and roughage and grain, really, really important in the risk of those diseases. But I do think that gastric ulcers play a role in that. I think that when we look at horses that have recurrent hindgut colic, whether it be a surgical lesion or whether it be horses that have um, recurrent impactions and stuff like that, we see those horses overrepresented with having egus, particularly with having glandular gastric disease. So if I have a horse with recurrent colic, as a, as a patient, one of the first things I do is go and look in that stomach and see if there's any disease in the stomach that may be then further contributing to downstream function. And I picked something up from someone yesterday that, you know, the stomach's the quarterback of the gastrointestinal tract. So changes in the stomach are going to have an impact the whole way through the system. Hmm. So it's not necessarily the surgery that causes the problem. It's what caused the problem in the first place um, that probably carries through. Um, and it carries through more than just those surgical colic lesions. Gotcha. Um, so here's another one about, and this is roughage is so important to horses, and many of the horses are hay dunkers. Um, does dunking the hay in the water help them easily or digest it, or does it have any effect on the stomach? And kind of related is we've seen a new trend of hay steamers in some of the performance horse barns. Can you talk about water, hay, and dust suppression, and dunking the hay and steaming the hay is related to egus and gastric, and gastric issues? Yeah, the, the, we don't know, I think is, is the short answer. Um, I think we separate a soaking hay. So when we're talking about horses with metabolic problems mm -hmm. and we're soaking the hay, the reason we're soaking the hay is to reduce the non-structural carbohydrate, the sugar load of the hay. And that's going to have an indirect benefit on gastric ulcer risk, squamous gastric disease risk, because uh, the less sugar we have in the stomach, the less fermentation and production of volatile fatty acids we get. Is it a real, real change? Probably not, because those horses are probably already eating a relatively low amount of sugar that it's not a major problem compared to the horses that we feed a ton of sweet feed or something to stuff that we don't tend to do anymore because, because of what we've learned over the years. Um, steaming hay, uh, dunking hay probably doesn't have a direct effect. What has a really big effect on squamous disease risk is the amount of time you spend grazing and the number of chews you have per mouthful. The more you chew, the more saliva you make, the more saliva you make, the more that goes into your stomach, the more buffering you get and the more protection you get from squamous gastric disease. So one of the benefits of hay over say a grain is that horses spend a lot longer eating hay and they chew a lot more per mouthful for hay than they do for, um, than they do for grain. So, um, it's this saliva load that's really important. Whether steaming hay or whether dunking hay changes their eating behaviour, I don't know. I don't think we've specifically looked at. Uh, if anything, I think they may probably eat a little bit slower and a little bit more deliberately with that with that type of hay, uh, which would actually be a benefit for for squamous disease. No no impact on glandular disease, but a benefit for squamous disease. And what about hay nets compared to feeding on the ground? So. Um, what we know is, is horses are, well, they're funny creatures. I think we can probably all agree on that. Um, <laughs> but, but one of the, one of their quirks is, you know, they're designed to, etiologically, they're designed to graze and they're designed to sort of eat, walk, eat, walk, eat, walk. Um, they don't stay in one place and eat. Um, they, 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 you know, they're constantly on the move and they mirror that behavior, even if you put them in a stall. So if you feed them, um, not so much a difference, uh, you know, between a hay net and hay on the ground per se. But for example, if you spend, if you feed them with two hay nets, identical hay, but in two places in the stall versus one hay net in one corner, they spend more time eating. Um, and they spend more time replicating this normal grazing behavior. So they'll eat at one hay net and they'll go across and eat at the other hay net and they'll just go back and forward, um, replicating this normal grazing behavior of what they do in the wild. And what we know is, is that particularly they do that overnight. So as one of the risk factors for squamous gastric disease, it's not that well talked about, it's exercising first thing in the morning. Because exercising first thing in the morning, horses naturally stop eating overnight. They go to sleep. They don't continuously graze. Um, that's a furphy um, that that's, was put out there 20 years ago, and it's, it's not true. Horses basically stop eating or at least reduce the time they spend eating to less than 10, 20% of their time 
um, at about 10 o'clock at night. Now, that's a generalization across all horses. Obviously, individuals are different. And then they, they, they stop eating at about six o'clock in the morning. They wake up and start eating again. But if you look at the pH in that squamous mucosa, it gets quite acidic in those wee hours of the morning. Um, and if you exercise a horse then, then you've got less roughage and you've got more to splash around. So one of our strategies for those horses is to give them multiple hay nets. And so that the horses are spending more time grazing and that reduces the amount of um, acid that accumulates in the stomach overnight. There's more buffering effectively. We then can look at other hay nets like slow feeders and things like that. Um, and they would be beneficial for squamous disease risk. Because again, it goes back to the longer the horse spends eating, the more saliva it produces, the greater squamous disease risk. As long as it's not overtly behaviorally stressful for the horse and potentially increasing glandular disease risk. So that's where you start separating them and, and sometimes playing one against the other, depending on the individual horse. Although I don't think that some horses, yeah, I don't think that, that those slow feeders are overly stressful for horses. I think they adapt to them quite quickly once they realize they can get what they want out of them. It just takes them a bit longer. Mm -hmm. And two more questions, unless we get to some other ones. Um, and I think you may address this, but I'm not sure. There has not been any studies looking at the long-term effect or the interaction with a meprazole and NSAID administration, correct? So no, there's really only that one study that we that I showed there towards the end, and that was really over seven to 14 days. Originally, it was a 14 day study, and they actually truncated it back to seven days as they went through their sort of cycles because of the side effects they were seeing. Um, we don't have we have very very little data on long term imipazole. Period. Um, we've got limited efficacy data. You, you know, a handful of studies looking at long term efficacy, um, mm -hmm. and we've got very when we talk about safety data we have safety data from the fda registration point of view um which is a lot about uh biochemical changes liver disease you know changes to the liver and kidney function and these sorts of things there's good data on that you know the drugs have gone through regulatory pathways throughout the world multiple times what we don't have is drugs good drug specific safety data so what we don't have is those factors we talked about i talked about at the end of the talk there the impact on rebound hypergastric acidity the impact on intrachromophon like cell proliferation in the stomach um, and, and what, that, what role that might play, um, the impact of fracture risk, and then also the impact of non steroidals and um, omeprazole combined for long periods. But what we see with that recent study is, is that there's a short term risk. So it's kind of hard to believe there's not potentially a long term risk um, associated with, with using those drugs particularly as we understand more about the role of the microbiota in the gastrointestinal tract um, and the impact of, of, of all of these drugs have, I mean, everything impacts the microbiota to some degree, um, but the potential impact for drugs like the non steroidals the potential impact for the drugs like um, the, the, the meprazole class drugs, we know that independently they can affect microbiota in other species. Um, so cumulatively, you know, is there a cumulative risk? It's it's not fully even understood in humans what that risk is, but it appears to be there. And the last one is, what is the labeled use or the correct use of omeprazole? Uh, because we know, and the question's kind of big, but we know a lot of our racehorses here that are in the States and then a lot of performance horses are on them for extended periods of time, uh, probably more than what label use is. And I think the question's more, What's label use and then what's the danger of not using it correctly or what, what happens when you don't use it correctly? Yeah, so the, I mean, the, the, the treatment dose is 28 days. And then um, at least that's the, most, that's the most common one when we talk about internationally. Um, Australia's a bit of an exception because we have a range of imeprazole products on the market. Um, the, and then the prevention, and that's at four megs per kg. And then the prevention comes down to one meg per kg for ongoing maintenance. Um, I think it is important when we start talking about the potential of side effects, it's important to always come back and say, these are drugs with clear benefit in, in many horses and in many of our populations. What we need to do though, is balance that up against, you know, the potential for risk. Um, and we need to understand more about risk before we can say that in a meaningful way. So it's important not to walk away and say, well, oh, we're going to stop using them because they might do bad things. And forget the fact that they do do good things as well. And they do lots of good things. 
what I think it does is I think it pushes the conversation back towards we've probably got a little um, complacent over time of saying, well, we've identified this problem, we found the solution, we've solved the problem, we can not worry about that anymore, we'll move on to our next problem because there's always another problem to solve. What it says is I think we probably need to go back into that conversation and say, recognise, first of all, that our long-term prevention strategies may not be as effective as we think they are. Um, so we actually have horses that are on long-term prevention that still get disease, um, particularly glandular disease. We've got no evidence to support long-term omeprazole therapy for the prevention of glandular disease. We've also got no evidence to say that it doesn't work. We just don't have any evidence, period. Um, but we do know when we drop the dose, um, like I showed you in some of that, some of the work you guys supported, when you drop the dose, you do drop the amount of acid suppression you get, particularly in the ventral part of the stomach where those glandular lesions occur. So I think it's unlikely that at the one mg per kg, particularly in horses consuming roughage, it's very unlikely that we're getting a real meaningful protective effect against glandular gastric disease over the long term. Um, when we think about racehorses and the differences in diet, it's a different story. But we still need to recognise that we're only talking about 50 to 70% of the horses getting long-term protection um, versus you know, a common assumption is if you put them on the drug, they're protected. Um, and I, I, we need to move away from that. And then that pushes the conversation back to having conversations about other management strategies that we've maybe got a little bit complacent on. We recognize the need for these horses to consume high calorie based diets to perform at elite level. But can we do that in a different way? Can we move, continue to move away from carbohydrates to, you know, fat based sources, these sorts of things. Can we look at rather than just give the horses ad libitum hay, which we, we do in a meaning, you know, in a well meaning way, can we actually look at using that more strategically? So, for example, feeding those horses, specifically feeding those horses alfalfa hay um, before they exercise, so that um, because that's the that's the period when all the damage is done. And so not just the provision of the feed, but being a little bit more specific and targeted about exactly how we use it. And then using that to reduce the overall background risk which then reduces our reliance on a, on a medication, which means if there are side effects, um, the less we use it, the less we're gonna see those side effects at a population level. And particularly when we start thinking about, you know, potentially really significant side effects like fractures, um, you know, the less we use them, the better, but we shouldn't ignore that they still have a very positive place in our, in our overall management of these horses. So you know, you can go in circles all day on this because it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just one of the thoughts I had when you were talking about is one of the things that American trainers or that, uh, worldwide trainers for the most part, a lot of them will pull hay 48 hours before a race or 24 hours before an important breeze or work. And what you're telling me is it probably is counterintuitive. Uh, like me playing golf, it's swing easier, not swing harder. Uh, maybe it's a, leave the hay to help their gut instead of take the hay away. Yeah. And the other thing that we didn't talk about, which is really relevant there. So, so yeah, you, you know, that's going to have big impacts on their, on their disease risk. Um, it's good. We haven't even talked about the hind gut, which is a little bit of a, a Pandora's box that we only, we know so little about in the horse, but we are starting to recognize in these really high performance horses, there may be some really significant things that we need to be looking at. Um, the, the when we talked about the rebound gastric hyperacidity, the other thing that we haven't talked about is you know withdrawal times for racing, and they vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. They may be as short as one clear day, they may be as long as four days in certain jurisdictions around the world. When you have horses on these, this is where we talk about this buildup of gastrin. As this gastrin builds up over time, um, and the longer we have them on them, presumably the higher it builds up. When you take them off, that acid suppression of the last dose only lasts 12 to 24 hours. And then after that, the horse starts making acid again. If you've had a buildup of, gastric, of gastrin, it makes more acid than it normally would. I mean, horses are already pretty good at making acid and now they've got an even bigger drive and they make even more acid. So in fact, what we might be doing is by having the withdrawal times, which are there for, for integrity of racing reasons, what we might actually be doing is setting up these horses to have the worst of the rebound clinical signs right about the time they race um, and actually, you know, really potentially negatively affecting their performance. So we've done some preliminary working work looking at horses as little as 72 hours after withdrawal of a metrazole 
developing quite severe squamous lesions. Um, so within those, you know, within those withdrawal windows, if you then compound that just purely from a gastric, from a stomach perspective, compound that by removing the roughage, then you're going to have an even, you know, even more significant effect there. Um, the removing of the roughage is, is to do with weight and there's other factors that play into that. But if we think just from the stomach's point of view, uh, it's almost the worst thing we could do to the stomach would be stop the drug, use the drug for a while, stop the drug, and then withdraw the, the natural protective mechanisms as well. That's really going to set us up for a really pronounced rebound event and, and may well set us up for impaired performance um, because, because we know that in people that get this, it's a really unpleasant experience, you know, very, very severe heartburn. Um, even at mild levels, though, in human elite human athletes that get heartburn, it impacts their performance, not just because it's uncomfortable, um, but, but it has physiological impacts on their performance. And so we may be inadvertently setting them up to perform worse by trying to make them perform better in the first place. Yeah, I would imagine running 35 miles an hour with bad heartburn is pretty tough, even if you have four legs. So, yeah, well, yeah, we uh, underestimate how tough they are, I think. Yeah, it, uh, they are a magnificent creature. Uh, that's for sure. From uh, the way they run, their mechanisms for running to processing food to the volume of blood that pumps through their veins when they're at high speed. Uh, to the to the length they can carry individuals and, and uh, mm. help us all move across the world. So uh, I don't see any other questions. This has been great. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I think it's this evening for you, is it? Uh, so um, uh, again, thank you so much. Your research has been very valuable for not only performance horses, for, uh, but for my horse in the backyard. Uh, uh, that has a little bit of problem uh, as well with uh, this and some of our staff. So we're very appreciative of uh, your work and the time that you've had today. And thanks again so much, Ben. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you to, for the people watching and, and to the Grayson Jockey Club. The, the, the support's been invaluable and allow us to answer these questions and to, to everyone who donates and, and contributes to that. It's really greatly appreciated from the, from the coalface. Well, good. We'll post it to YouTube and I'll let everybody know when it's up. Thanks again, Ben. Have a good evening now. No.